And welcome. My name's Andy Reid. I'm the director of the Sports Think Tank. And today we're joining one of the 29 organisations that have helped us in our 2024 manifesto project. We were challenged to come up with policy ideas for a new government after the next election, which would probably not have great resource implications. As we all know, the economy and the public finances are in a position where spending is going to be very difficult for the next period. So these individual organisations have come together. We've created the pamphlet, which is available on our website, but we wanted to give each of the contributors a little bit more time to expand on what they're trying to say in their chapter. So let's head over to the next one in this series of this Sports Think Tank 2024 Manifesto. Well, hello and welcome to the latest uh, podcast in this series, looking at the uh, 100 Manifesto ideas from our pamphlet recently. And I'm delighted to welcome pr probably a good friend of mine now, now, actually, over the years that we've served together on boards and known each other, but Lisa Forsyth from Max Associates. And as always, I'm going to hand over to Lisa to explain uh, her role, how she's got here and her service in this sort of sector, mm -hmm. and a little bit more about the company. And then we'll just get into the chapter and start to unpick some of the great ideas and some of the experience that Lisa has had. So welcome, Lisa. It's great to see you. Lovely to see you as well, Andy, and good to catch up. As you say, it's quite nice to have a, a chat with an old friend. So I'm looking forward to this podcast a lot. So do you want me to, what do you want to do? Shall I jump yeah, into just, the associates? Yeah, just go straight into who you, who, yeah. Yeah, how we, who you are. As you've seen, the chapters are great because there's a whole group of people who've come together and hopefully it's sort of really hopefully sparks varied. some friendships across the different parts of the sector as well. Cool. Well, let me. So I'm um, Lisa Forsyth, Managing Director of Max Associates. Um, it was interesting. I was thinking about this. We used to describe ourselves as a sport, leisure and culture consultancy. And that was back in the, you know, real old lingo. And I think as a sector, we've really moved on. So very much around local authority, um, delivering physical activity through sport and leisure. And that might be um, leisure centres. Um, we do a lot of feasibilities for refurbishments, for new bills. Um, we do a lot of procurement in terms of where local authorities are retendering. And interestingly, at the moment, as things sort of change and the industry moves on, we're doing quite a lot of options appraisals. So local authorities sat there going, for example, we've had all our leisure centres tended out for a number of years. And we're now thinking, should we bring them back in house? Should we set up a, a LATC, which is a local authority trading company? Should we work with another council and almost do some sort of joint venture? So that's really it's really interesting. Um, we also do quite a lot of strategic reviews. So we're all really good, I think, in the sector of saying we're providing, you know, sports centres or physical activity programmes. But it's uh, reminding ourselves, are we providing them for the right people? You know, the yeah. people that can make the biggest difference. So that's quite important. Um, and I guess my interest in this is we predominantly work with local authorities. They're yeah. the main providers of public sports centres and swimming pools. And the underlying question I still get day in, day out is whatever I do, is it financially sustainable? Mm. And that might be through a revenue perspective, or I have, we might have some capital or access to capital, but can I afford to deliver these services going forward? So I think that's, for me, a really interesting backdrop to what we do in terms of local authority provision. Um, because I guess the one thing that is a sector I'm really excited by what we've done in the last 18 months is this, we're not just providing sports centres anymore because we love them. We're actually changing people's health, their activity levels. They're reducing health inequalities. And wow, you know, again, all the chapters have talked about all the benefits and what we're doing. I guess the issue I have on a day to day basis, it's the local authorities yeah. at the moment who are still funding the bricks and mortars of our public estate. And that's it's kind of unsustainable at the moment from what you know from what we're seeing so so yeah. yeah so that's kind of what we're doing and that's what some of the areas that are the chapter that sort of myself at max and the team have helped put together yeah no, that's brilliant that's a great introduction to it because actually there are a series of challenges here aren't they and, and probably starting off with your as you started at the beginning um 
the language. Yeah, I mean, I used to work in um, at local authority in the Department of Recreation and Arts as sort of part of that, and that leisure was part of. We had a play team, develop, you know. So there has been enormous change in the landscape. So we can, we can look at that, but also in terms of those financial pressures. I mean, we almost probably don't want to start there, but that, that is the challenge, isn't it? Is that you've, yeah, you've got a, a stock that was probably built 70s and 80s where there was a lot of stock it's coming to a, a period in its history where actually physically it does need replacing some models have changed so do you want to just talk a little bit through where we're at in terms of stock and I think particularly with your chapter it's really strong mm -hmm. is you don't just look at lo local authority leisure but that education space as well because actually in terms of usage yeah. of facilities if you get those two right that's probably a pretty big percentage of where most of us will probably do yeah. some of our existing yeah. sport physical activity. No, absolutely. And I think it, it things sort of struck me where we do um, we do quite a lot of indoor built facility strategies. And it's quite a um, formulaic, you know, what's the population today? Um, how many sports halls have we got? How many swimming pools? And, you know, what's the population in 20 years? And, you know, how many people are going to be wanting to use that? And is that increasing or decreasing? And it's always focused on, I guess, traditional sports facilities. So swimming pools, sports halls, bowls, tennis, you know, th those types of facilities. And I guess on one hand, you go, this is really positive. I think, you know, late 70s, 78, 77, 78 percent of us all live within two miles of a swimming pool. So you kind of go, brilliant. That's, re that's really good. But I guess many of them are not accessible because they're on school facilities, educational um, yeah. facilities bases and I guess we've got a position where you've talked about aging stock where you've got local authority provision which as you say I think the LGA uh, pre-COVID were saying that two-thirds of the estate was getting to a point where it needed replacing yeah. Sport England was also you know was talking billions of you know yeah. um, billions of pounds to re to fund and we're also at the same time where we're trying to um, reduce our carbon emissions so actually, we've got this old ageing stock of what I would call traditional sports facilities, which yeah. the local authority is trying to provide. And then if you take education, and I mean, education obviously so wide, you go from primary schools, secondary schools, all the way through to further education universities. Yeah. And you've got some fabulous facilities there, and particularly if you take into account private and independent um, schools as well. I mean, you've got um, an, um, uh, an amazing sort of portfolio of facilities. But again, they've got the same issues. They were built a number of years ago. And, um, you know, if we take schools, I guess, because that's the easiest sort of way to, way to think about it, they've got different priorities. So today their priorities are education and there's less joined up thinking. And I guess it's a, one of those unintended consequences where you think of the academisation of, of schools where it's taken away for various reasons that I'm not an expert on in terms of um, local authority, direct local authority provision to academies, which, you know, from an education perspective is, is you know, either does or doesn't make sense. I don't think we'll get into that, that discussion now. <laughs> but from a sports facilities um, yeah. situation, it makes it harder to plan. Absolutely. So, you know, and at the same time, after COVID, the education priorities were getting children's academics and um, uh, attainments they'd missed so much. But again, one of those consequences were, and I think there was, um, there's been various studies, but it, the projection is, is about, you know, 43% of key stage two children will be able to swim. And if yeah. you come from a more deprived area, that drops right down to 35%. Yeah. And you think, gosh, you know, 35% um, of 11 year olds can swim 25 metres. We're not even talking, you know, hundreds and hundreds of metres, that feels to me is a really lost life skill that children, once you don't learn to swim as a child, you're so much less likely to swim as you get older. And I'm sure, yeah, there's lots of other bodies that can talk about that. So I guess for me, we've got two issues happening in parallel. You've got the education, who've got lots of sports facilities, um, but have got different priorities. You've got local authorities, and we talked about this before, where we're saying they've just got less resources, they've got mm. older facilities. Yeah. So for me, it just seems like we could have some really good solutions and not more expensive by joined up. Yeah. Joined up because at the moment the priorities are different. Yeah. You know, the priorities are very different from education to local authorities, particularly if you take a district council. They're not worried about um, health and well-being or their, their resources and their priorities, responsibilities are not health and well-being or prevention. And nor are they 
educational. Yeah. So it's trying to say how do we get different government um, departments to plan more effectively together on for, for sports facilities. Yeah, and that's a really good point you make. I mean, I often use that phrase as well, but the unintended consequences of an educational sort of policy change and, as you say, free schools and academisation, um, it does feel quite, you know, I've said this on other podcasts, but, you know, international friends find it quite strange that surely they're still owned, they're, they're still state mm-hmm. schools, aren't they? How can you not sort of have a little bit more control over what is available? And I know there's some money is available through different government programmes for opening up school yeah. buildings and, you know, that's, that's made some marginal improvements, but... I just always still feel that it was definitely one of those things that you needed to have thought through. And that's why this check, this policy yeah. and lots of others do require a cross government approach yeah. to a particular solution because it isn't in that isolation. But I suppose just coming back to you, you know, particularly around the local government, so we can look at that again, but around the local government stuff, it is the elephant in the room, isn't it? It's just that the last decade or so, the amount of monies and the squeeze that's been on local authorities, discretional spend. And as you say, some authorities are really good and they put health and well-being, they understand that, but actually the financial pressures on them for adult and child social yeah. care as well as homelessness and a whole series of other things. And we've seen local authorities, they haven't gone bankrupt. Section 114 is something slightly different, but you know the headlines talk about it like that. So what are you finding the, the best local authorities are able to do? You said like coming up with clever solutions. What does that sort of look like on, on the ground? And also... We'll, again, we'll talk a little bit more about it, but just one of the highlights, I suppose, is you also say quite rightly in your piece that actually it's the most inactive are possibly those not accessing the current stock. So we don't want to lose the current stock, but what? how different does it need to look to start to improve the levels of activity amongst those who currently aren't sort of inside yeah. our current systems? So it's quite a lot there, but allow you to unpack. Because again, it's all joined up, isn't it? It's all joined up. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I guess it's a couple of things. If... There are some councils, it depends on the makeup of, uh, of local authorities, as we know they're all different. We've seen some great examples where you have, count, and it's easier with councils with higher density of populations and a various, you know, in terms of a range of demographics within a local authority. Because what you can see is you can see some good quality local authority facilities people will use and they're prepared to pay for a good quality mm. facility. And in effect, what the councils can do is offset that um, to cross-subsidise either investment or dedicated programmes in other areas. Mm. So that's slightly easier, and so that tends to be urban. So we've done yeah. a lot of work across London boroughs, for example, where, you know, they can absolutely... I mean, if you take, you know, an example in terms of Westminster, they've got mm. some really um, high um, sort of throughput workers... Mm. And they can really, you know, um, really commercialise, I guess. And it's not yeah, as well yeah. that we shouldn't be scared of using yeah. some of their leisure facilities. But what they can do is they can then cross-subsidise the work. Because mm. interesting, for example, in Westminster, they've got some of the areas of the highest deprivation mm. as well as mm. some of the areas of the least. Yeah. And so literally next door to each other in a place like that, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, yeah I mean, absolutely. There, but... yeah. yeah, no. Yeah. So, but it does give you a way of being able to um, cross-subsidise within a department one area than another. But then I guess if you take more rural areas or areas where they've got higher um, higher sort of um, uh, levels of places with deprivation, it's harder to do that. And that's yeah. where you find that councils are absolutely working together. And it might be regeneration, it might be town centre development, it might be tourism, where you're having to pull to, you know, um, different... Uh, funding routes and types of facilities together mm. Mm. and that's why we've seen some great examples of not just providing a leisure centre which is a swimming pool a sports hall and a gym you're also providing it could be a tourist attraction it could be a com- you know something commercial it could be other council services which are co-located it, yeah. it becomes a bit of an asset question you know can I have a um, you know a, a library a swimming pool um, a sports hall together and maybe with an activity zone, because mm. we've all come from, you know, a lot of um, us in the industry where sport is really important to us. And it might be mm. hockey or football or basketball or volleyball. But remember, we're a real small minority of people across mm. the UK who actually want to do that. And actually, it might be dance. It might yeah. be um, drama. It might be meeting somewhere and going for a walk and having a social. It might be something for kids where it's not, you know, a sport, badminton or football, team sports that can be quite tricky. I just want to have fun and be active. So we're seeing some great examples where it's not 
um, it's not just a traditional leisure centre and we've got some examples in the piece where it's much wider and that's where councils can work better with partners to, to co-fund and that you know there's been some great funding recently in terms of towns fund leveling up fund where um, sport physical activity health and well-being is part of that project so for example we're working in South Holland where they've managed to get some leveling up funding and it's a it's a whole campus approach so you've got um, a swimming pool which is really important mm-hmm. it's the mm-hmm. swimming pool in the district you've got an activity zone for kids you've got bowls um, which is really important for an older generation. You've also got um, uh, mental health services and activities planned next to extra care accommodation and lots of activity trails um, around it for physical activity and not just sport. So it's where different departments come together mm. and then can attract funding, which is making a big difference. Yeah. I assume that also then translates to all this sort of place based approach, the systems thinking is that it's other people across different parts of the local authorities and others that then start to see the benefits of physical activity. Because we've still got quite a case to make, haven't we? As you say, there's those of us who do it, don't understand why others don't. And I always say to people when I was in worked in DCMS in the ministerial team, it was a bit the same with the arts lobby. I sort of got it was a good, but I didn't fundamentally feel it in my core. Whereas we in the sports world, do you know what I mean? I, so, so it's a similar sort of approach, isn't it? I try to say to people, there are other people who look mad, you know, like I run around in the mud playing rugby on a Saturday and on a Wednesday night. Well, why would you? I mean, that you, people look at you gone out, don't you? Quite rightly. So so don't assume the person on the other side is, is feeling sport and physical activity and gets yeah. it in the same way. Yeah. I think that's one of my frustrations we're all a bit too keen sometimes aren't we and I think the other side of it this goes back to what we've done with you know how do local authorities do this I always think it's really interesting because you've got to get down to the detail it goes back to your point about really understanding the local area because what we do sometimes is we we map all the known users of the leisure centres and sometimes you can go brilliant you really are attracting all the the local community and all different types of people and then sometimes you go hand on heart are we are we actually attracting those that can afford to pay and if we are great but let's charge them the rate that they can afford and not necessarily yeah. cost subsidise everybody. So it's really understanding. And then, and then, you know, we and again have said, OK, if people aren't being active, how do we go and find what the barriers are? Mm. You know, and what do we need to do? And I think for us, it's not it's not simplifying that. It's actually taking time and local authorities and partners in the voluntary sector really taking time to understand communities and yeah. understanding what would inspire them and what would motivate yeah. them, as opposed to us doing a top down going, oh, wouldn't it be really good if we put a new gym over there yeah. or a yeah. sports hall over there? Because that's yeah. that's just not the answer. And it takes time and it's not easy. And it's, yeah. you know, there's different, there's lots of, you know, loads of research out there in terms of different barriers, but we've got to understand it and be realistic. We're either providing a commercial facility because people in a diff- demographic area can afford to pay and they're willing to, and we might cross subsidise another area, and that's, that's what yeah. I think you know it's important yeah. and to acknowledge to acknowledge that. But I think where we were, what, what we were trying to say is we could see a really interesting model come up if we start to plan education sites mm. with local authority sites. So if we take away all the history and who draws up what happens in both areas and said what could we do because you know. Schools tend to be quite traditional in terms of sports. You want children to learn a variety of sports, try a variety of sports, whether it's, you know, on sports halls, swimming pools, outdoor grass pitches. So if we could just think about these and understand why um, schools have difficulty in providing those facilities to communities as well, they generally come down to two things. Safeguarding issues, obviously, making sure that in terms of from a design perspective, you can separate out as needs be obviously children Mm -hmm. and public, and also cost. And you touched upon before, there are are some funding in terms of enabling um, schools to be um, sort of open during opening hours. But if we could just plan this better, because I think in the piece we point out, there's over a third of um, sports halls and swimming pools and educational um, establishments that just have no use at all for community. They're just yeah. not accessible at all. And you just think, gosh, that's wrong. Because if we can, you know, get past, and it might be design and there may be some investment, but yeah. surely it's cheaper to invest in our existing facilities or if we're going to have to reprovide, plan them better. Yeah. So that, wouldn't it be great if our local, because hubs, schools are hubs, schools are hubs mm-hmm. in the community. Let's not try and make some new ones because yeah. they're already yeah. there. <laughs> so if they became 
are traditional sports centres, swimming pools that children learn to swim. They try different sports. There are pitches there. They're already. And that's and if they're then available for clubs, for lessons, for after school um, activities, things like the healthy um, food and activity programmes during school holidays. That's great. They can they can do that. And what that would enable is potentially local authority facilities to be slightly different. Mm. Because you could take those traditional sports facilities and for you and me, if we loved our football or hockey, we could go through to clubs. We could potentially go, you know, through to elite performance. Obviously, you're going to have different levels of, you know, in terms of cities and urban, um, you know, size of facilities. But that enables local authority type facilities to be very different. You know, mm. In rural areas, we might just have smaller 20 metre pools. Yeah. That might be better. Yeah. Or we may end up going, actually, yeah, we do want to provide um, gyms and studios for people that want to be active. But those spaces, you know, as opposed to having a six court and eight court sports hall, which are huge, we can have actually smaller um, multi, uh, multi-use multi facilities. Mm. Yeah. It might be targeted programmes, exercise on referral, cardiac rehabilitation, some of the amazing programmes. And I won't go into them because they're all, you know, the different chapters <laughs> talk about them. You just need the space. It doesn't, you know, you need to have the space and the coach so that could happen. And then you can be commercial in those demographic areas that you can be commercial or you may co-locate with other council facilities. But I guess what we're not saying is let's provide a sports hall, a swimming pool, grass pitches at schools and then try and replan them and reprovide them as local authority facilities as well. And that's where I think we could start to make some different and different towns and cities will reflect the needs of their communities and be different. Yeah, precisely. And that's the key bit, really, isn't it, from what you're saying, is that um, possibly in the past, especially that period of the 70s or so, where the traditional, I think you're probably now trying to really work on all these places. You you can almost, that's right, you could almost just pick one up and drop it sort of anywhere if there was an available piece of land. But now it is much more about co creating the solutions for the communities and they look and feel very different, different. can't they, because of the communities they're trying to, 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 to serve. And you're right, the, the, the school's bit, I'll handle, hold up my hand, and nearly all of my sport has been played through community colleges or, or, or I train, I played my rugby, I've always been on school facilities and it just seems stupid to go and then recreate another whole set of facilities mm-hmm. when, uh, and it is something I think that probably we're quite strong on, not just us, but those community cohesion spaces where people do coalesce and come together for me, the role of sport, physical activity and community is tackling that loneliness and the social cohesion stuff as well as just the sort of physical activity that sort of comes from it. And if we've, we're losing the church and public buildings and youth centres, probably clubs and schools could pro- yeah. you know, increasingly become the only touch points where people physically come together. So, yeah, yeah it's quite an interesting, you know, from a local authority perspective, how do you look at what you've got, uh, village halls in other areas? So, yeah, yeah two, just one badminton court in a small village hall is better than eight 30 miles away in a large town, isn't it? So, yeah, yeah what does that yeah, look absolutely. like look like sort of, yeah. um, locally? And I suppose the other bit, I don't know whether your experience of this, Lisa, but, you know, I joked earlier, so many years ago, working in the Recreation and Arts Department, we had community support workers, but we, ha- we also had sports development officers yeah um, now they their role will have changed over the years and many of them have lost but again probably investment in the development of those new yeah. forms of what that looks like, well, building so what's your experience yeah. of that no i think it's really important and it's, it's one of the themes that's coming through really strongly now is as you say we were quite inward looking in terms of sports development and telling mm. people how wonderful sports was we may yeah. as you say sports development workers used to go out to the community and try and tell people how good sport was yeah, and, I think, yeah. Yeah. and I think we're really learning and, you know, Simspa is playing a role in this in terms of upskilling staff across the industry yeah. is that actually we need to just understand people, the barriers, mm. the health, the wellness side of things. Because if people don't want to obviously be physically active through sport, what's mm. the, and it goes back to what you said, what's the other hook? It's yeah. good for me. It's social. It's fun. Mm. And we need to get away from, you know, teaching people and coaching people technically Mm. we need to then get back out into the community and just understand what would in in motivate and encourage and inspire them just to be a bit more active Mm -hmm. and understand the barriers are in place because again it's really interesting we do a lot of research and the interesting um sort of two key things that come up is always the first thing is cost and time Mm. 
But actually, if you value something, you'll then find the time, you know, you'll find the time to do it. And ultimately, you prioritise, you know, in terms of cost. Now, I appreciate cost in terms of cost of living. It's a very Mm. complex issue. But it's how do we inspire people that they value Mm. and want to be active? And Mm. and as you say, it's not in a leisure centre. It might just be meeting up with friends and going for a walk. Yeah. Yeah. And it might, you know, it's that time. There's again, yeah. I won't get into there's so much research out there, but you're right. And I think from a and, you know, a lot of whether it's local authority deliverers or operators are rethinking the skills that staff need. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that's what's it's massively yeah. important. Absolutely. And that's why I've quite enjoyed doing this whole thing, because, you know, you've got 29 different chapters, but I mean, there could be 100 of them. And we're all in these sort of slightly different places, aren't we? With different yeah segments of the community so you know, I really make this important point that I don't want to get rid of local authority or other private sector sort of gym facilities because they they meet the needs of a group of people important. it's just yeah. recognizing at population level which needs aren't being met and how that you do that and actually a physical um, activity may just be we've got the outdoor groups that have done some great work around blue space and green spaces and yeah. just you know just go, being able to be in nature as we know is like an enormous lift and we actually do need it we do need all of that so yeah so all of these are relevant and, and I, I think sometimes we we'll get in our little bits of silo don't we as though ours is the answer and I think yeah. what's great hearing you Lisa is just that mm-hmm. understanding that you've got to make some seeds in this bit but actually there's some really other good stuff that we need to do at the same time yeah. no massively um, and I think councils are prioritizing and as you you know yeah. you rightly say in terms of lots where we do a strategic review across um, a council area we might we might look at obviously sports centres because they're easy because mm. they're buildings and they're you know they're assets but absolutely do an audit there's some amazing activities going on in community mm. centres and churches and it's just space and if it's local to people then yeah. that's what they'll want to access as yeah. well as going actually we can make more of our green space of our mm. golf our golf courses don't have to just be golf for example yeah. they're amazing spaces um so yeah i think i think lots i think l- lots of organizations are recognizing that yeah. and sometimes it's having to prioritize and go okay what's working for my community and where else do i need to invest to increase activity yeah and there's other peripheral things aren't they i mean you talked talk about some of those barriers i know particularly we're doing there's a great chapter here for women in sport the work we've been doing with them but some of that might just be around personal safety so yeah. i do have to walk through a yeah. dark alley to access the school sites that I do and you know I, I sort yeah. of okay with that but actually if I wasn't that would be enough of a barrier yeah. just walking across a churchyard a darkened churchyard in a very narrow alley on yeah. 99% of the time unlit because the, the the lights don't work I mean that that might be enough to change Huge. We do, it, yeah because yeah. we do a lot of in terms of research um th- and we, we ask people in terms of barriers what are your mm. barriers and mm. sometimes is um particularly using outdoor spaces yeah. yeah it's it's um safety and perception of safety yeah. and the other area which is really interesting is confidence i don't mm. have the confidence to start mm. so it's you know and sometimes it might simply be as you say um, lighting footpaths or ways through and it's a similar point that's come up a lot and it, it, reading recently in terms of why children don't cycle to school yeah it's that safety element um yeah. which which is really yeah. important so yeah absolutely it could be infrastructure in yeah. terms of making places feel much safer than they are yeah so again this sort of joined up approach to it all yeah. it's the same yeah that school stuff uh, for us, very similar isn't it <laughs> yeah cool got a call coming in which is sneaked through on my landline that's all right i'll let it out don't worry <laughs> but you're right so, uh, that, that, let's get that school example is a classic isn't it yeah. it's again unintended consequences of people driving to the school it makes it unsafe for people who want to cycle you know yeah. so there's a vicious circle there isn't it you don't yeah. cycle because everyone's going in their car and you go in a car because people aren't cycling so yeah where again there are loads of really good examples aren't there around the country where people and schools have worked really hard for walking school buses and cycling provision and making it much it's safer yeah. so again quite often it's just replicating the best practice isn't it and i, I think that's part mm-hmm. of your role isn't it because you learn from one place and take it into well, another hey this works over here yeah no massively it's one of those isn't it because we speak to we i mean it's 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 delightful for me we work mm. across um the ca- across the country yeah. we can work in rural areas we can work in urban areas and you can see people grappling with similar um yeah. issues and you go ah actually yeah. <laughs> over here 
this is what they've thought about doing and yeah. you know have you tried it and it's you know it's great where you see people go yeah that's a really good idea and like you know some of that is around how do you get and this is this sort of question of kids kind of go to school don't they and they they hopefully have swimming lessons and they get an introduction to sport and physical activity and then they hit this 11 plus and they kind of stop being active and they've got different priorities so for me it's how do you get you know you almost do you, you re, we're really good at sort of under under 10s and then we're pretty good at sort of 25 plus to a certain mm. extent but for me how do you get people active between sort of 11 to 25 mm. and then how do you get people active as they get older because that's the other area where obviously with an aging population yeah. We can't just keep replicating what we've got. So you're absolutely yeah. right. Where we've seen, I mean, you've probably, I don't know if part of the chapters where you've seen some some great activity areas within leisure centres, you know, where you've got big um, clip and climb or tag active or splash pads or just fun stuff mm. for kids, which yeah. is a slightly different age group where we've traditionally focused on, where they learn to swim and if they don't go onto a club, they just kind of, you know, st stop yeah. being active. Yeah. And also um, seeing some really social spaces specifically for older people or people who are re rehabilitating out of injury. Mm. And you might have some of the um, sort of the, we you know, just assisted exercise suites, but it's mm. social. There's sofas in there. They're on the ground yeah. floor. They're easily accessible. And then you go, that's worked really well. Where can we pick that up and take that elsewhere? Yeah. So, so yeah, no, it's, it's really good to see that. Yeah. And because of that, you've given us a couple of examples of places where you've worked sort of in, in sort of this, this change mm. sort of process. So I suppose it's actually just talking a little bit through the process of change and the politics of changing the stock. Because it's, yeah. I can imagine, it's not always easy, is it? I mean, from a strategic point of view and from a management point of view, you could probably look at one of your reports and say, yeah, that all makes perfect sense. Yeah. But then you have to deal with um, local politics and the public and, and others. So what, really you want to talk a little bit through your experiences of that? Really? <laughs> yeah. Uh, when reality and strategy it hits. Yeah, no, it's, I really enjoy it when we work with councils because on one hand, you take us from one perspective who, who obviously don't know the council area particularly well when we go in yeah. and we take the evidence and we're able to see it from quite a an evidence-based position. And we take we try and speak as, with as many stakeholders as we can, and we get some in, amazing insight. And that kind of all comes together to you know to, to pull what you know the, the project group or um, working group would want to see as, as some of the solutions coming out. But it's still fascinating because those there's there's always two there's always two key um, challenges I would suggest is those existing users of existing facilities are obviously very happy yeah. with how things are and you know struggle to change, yeah. and we still also have the difficult political decisions two ways. <laughs> One is don't close a leisure centre or facility in my area. <laughs> yes. Um, and the other would be, and it's a you know a genuine concern of, if we're going to invest to save, how can we absolutely demonstrate we're going to get the revenue back to pay off yeah. the capital? Because that's a big business decision. Yeah. And if we're sat there, for example, saying strategically, for example, you've got five or six leisure centres, we think we need to change you know two or three into completely different mm -hmm. you know venues as we've as we've described there's a big capital cost there and it's yeah. the council's prioritizing how do you you know out of all the other things that they can do prioritize that particular capital cost um with the revenue payback now mm. one advantage that um this service has it generates income mm. cutting the grass doesn't filling the potholes doesn't yes. children adult social care doesn't so there's a massive opportunity the sector has because if you get the balance right and go back to the people that can afford to pay will pay you can actually cross subsidize your capital so you yeah. do have a, you're not trying to solely sort of look forward and go the social value of this would be x y and z you've also yeah. got some hard cash that can add to the equation so yeah. that is that helps but you've got to be absolutely damn sure of your business case because it's a big yeah. investment for for yeah. you know local authorities to go through but yeah it's change is difficult you know mm. even if we're saying for example you know, you've tended out these services for the last 20 years. You've not managed them ever in-house before. And you might say, well, what about a different model? Mm. 
or conversely, you've managed these services in house all this time. Is that really politically, strategically where you want to be? Yeah. So I think change takes time. You need to take the right people through and you absolutely need to ensure that both staff and elected members understand the outcomes and are taken through the journey. So that's yeah. crucial when it comes to decision making. Absolutely. And um, we all get, you know, um, I used to belong to the gym at a local leisure centre and I don't. But actually, if you yeah. propose to do something to it, even though I don't use it, I'd have a view and opinion. Yes. And, 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 you know, this is a bit slightly, it relates a bit to the post office sort of stuff. But I often used to say that when constituents would write and moan about post offices as well. If, 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 if 50 percent of you who wanted to keep the post yeah. office actually used them, then we might yeah. be in a slightly different position. So it's irrational. But I get it. People have a fear of any change that happens locally. Yeah. They might want to use it at some stage in the future. So it's quite yeah. brave politically to act, even yeah. though rationally it makes yeah. sense to close something down and consolidate. And I've seen all sorts of cases where it actually does work. But that first initial period when something looks like you're closing something can yeah. be difficult. And have you been able to help members and officers to sort of through that process by giving them not, you know, robustness in your evidence? Yeah, it is. It's, it goes back to what you said before. It's robustness of evidence. It's case studies of what of what um, has happened elsewhere, and it's also there to be. It's really honest in terms of the facilities now. Yes. Who are they delivering for? Who's using them? Are they the people that we really want to attract? Yeah. Or actually, going back to your point, you know, are they not actually being used, you know, well enough? So it is, and then providing the, you know, this could happen. If we if we do X, Y and Z, this is what we're looking to achieve. And sometimes it's a hard decision of you can't just slimy slice and make no. savings. Yeah. You know, you've got old buildings. They are going to fail. So let's be proactive as opposed to waiting until something like that happens. Yeah. So that's the other side of it is to say, let's be on the, you know, as, as a council, as elected members, as residents, mm -hmm. let's be on the front foot. Mm -hmm. Let's plan what's, you know, what's going to happen as opposed to it happen to us. Yeah. So that's, you know, and that, and that in fairness you know, we work with a lot of councils where their, their, their swimming pools are about to fall over. And it's, let's, you know, let's really plan this. Um, yeah. 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 So we're, we're I suppose that ties into something you said right at the beginning as well, Lisa, which we sort of briefly mentioned, but I mean, I've been doing some stuff on this, but around the local authorities' carbon emissions. I mean, there is one report, yeah. isn't it, that suggests that probably for a lot of district authorities, the, the carbon emission oh, from their leisure centre stroke swimming is about 40% of their carbon yeah. footprint. So what are the opportunities, I suppose, for sort of, are the good examples of low carbon or zero carbon solutions to some of this stuff that's coming on on stream that will really help them on that as well yeah there are there's almost i mean there's been some really in fairness there's been some good funding through um the public sector decarbonization scheme yeah. Yeah. um where local authorities have applied to in different tranches and some great companies who are coming up with solutions yeah. um to that all retrofit so yeah. if you, as you can imagine, that's retrofit. But for new facilities, there's all sorts. I mean, we've got two passive house leisure centres mm -hmm. in the country now, both at Exeter and Spellfall, which are really interesting. I think it's really brave of the councils to go forward mm -hmm. with those and try the technology because, mm -hmm. you know, without, you know, there's lots of doubters and yes. initial capital costs, which absolutely, but somebody's got to take the bullet and, and see if the, you know, see if these yeah. work. We're seeing sort of microfiltration, so in terms of different filtration. And so, yes, there's some, there is, there are examples coming through but it's difficult and it's costly and it's new yes. and it's innovative. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's the, you know, local authorities by nature, and, you know, there's no wrong in this, are a little bit nervous of being the first to jump. And, mm. you know, it's, it's ultimately it's um, residents' money that they're, yeah. you know, that they're, they're spending. So they've got to be safe. So, uh, but I think I'm, you know, this sector is is brilliant in coming up with solutions, you know, mm. in terms of you've got Leisure Energy, which is a company that's coming up with different solutions. You've got Alliance Leisure who are coming up with yeah. both physical activity and those types of solutions. So I think it's for us as a sector, as you say, to really um, showcase the good examples, be honest when things don't work and mm. be able to let, you know, let different councils know. Because, you know, from us, from a council perspective, they're... Um, that this sector's expertise is, is losing you know you will see a director of yeah. communities and they have less leisure experience so you yeah. know you know is, is this um whole pamphlet and um exercise is about is bringing all the good practice together to make it easier yeah. for people to make yeah. decisions yeah so, no, absolutely
And actually, what's been quite interesting is I just now feel there's another you know, another couple of hundred sort of bits out there that need to be yeah. brought into the, the piece. So actually, quite rightly, the only criticism for some people is that, oh, you needed this in and you need that in. And I get it, yes, because actually this is just a small proportion yeah. of the expertise that lies across, isn't it? But I think people have found it really useful to have everything in one place. You yes. Know, so you do get yes. a sense mm-hmm. that plays, it, it, like you've said it a few times, but fun. Actually, do you know what? What underpins all of this is fun. And then what also underpins it is the diversity and the inclusion sort of work. So, again, a little bit of a challenge, I think, to this part of the sector, isn't it, is that it's probably not been at the forefront of diversity and inclusion in some spaces. And some of the workforce doesn't probably reflect the communities in which they're trying to serve. So it's probably not entirely your expertise, but a little bit with your Simpsper hat on as well, isn't it? Because you you love this sector and you want to get it right. You know, is the progress being made? What more could we do? Looking at the three chaps around disability, women and sort of uh, minority ethnic groups in the, in this piece. You know, there is a challenge to the sector as well, isn't there? There is. And there is definitely a challenge. And I'll come back to sort of my area of expertise, which is local yeah. authority and decision sure. making. So if all the stuff that we've just talked about in terms of decisions about um, where facilities are, the funding of facilities, yeah. the management of facilities, you know, local authorities are, you know, I'll sit in a room. And it's not the, the the project team is not that diverse, you know, in terms of the, you know, underrepresentation is just historically not. So going back to your point, and as you say, with a Simspa hat on, that's, you know, how can we in our, you know, where we're at, try and empathise and understand with people who are not active. And we might say it from a sport perspective, because that's what we yeah. know, but also from a diversity and inclusion perspective. You know, really getting into communities and understanding. So until we really challenge and um, ensure that the decision makers are, um, you know, represent the people, represent communities, then then we're not there. But I think the first step is to recognise it and see what, you know, to ensure that going back to your point about um, where we're planning, co-creating and developing um, facilities and solutions and services we're absolutely talking to the communities that we're working with. But yeah. my absolute, you know, it'd be joyous if the decision makers were also, you know, as diverse as the populations using our, you know, we want to use yeah. our services. Yeah, yeah. And that's more a problem for the policymaking process, not just, the, you know, what we're talking about here. I mean, I recognise yeah. that right across the piece. And so yeah. I'm working with civil servants, trying to help them understand what co-creation looks like, not sort of national policies being dropped yeah. into local areas and I think you gave some examples obviously with levelling up and town deal sort of monies there is yeah. the opportunity for that sort of thing to happen in a slightly different way isn't there and, and I, I suppose so that helps but just on that I mean clearly we're trying to move away probably from the big standard box leisure centre I've seen a bit of work around redeveloping the high streets I mean it's everywhere yeah. high streets are I hate to use the word dying but I mean they are changing you know the high streets yeah. are changing continue to change and so there is an opportunity I assume they now become places for leisure rather than just shopping isn't there so yeah, it's an example of where that sort of works Lisa yeah. I, I, personally I'd like to pinch some ideas for some <laughs> areas around here you know where I think okay, we could do some of that I, I think we do we've you know we've worked with a number and again it comes down to funding but we've sort of seen where you may have because leisure centres historically tend to have great locations in mm. terms of where they're positioned yeah. um and we've, you know, we've worked particularly as a, just examples I'm thinking of now is almost coastal areas where, yeah. again, where you've got um, uh, areas where they're obviously very popular in the summer and, you know, really quiet during the during the winter. So it's, pro- it's how do you provide a leisure facility um, that can really regenerate that high street during um, both season and off season period and link in other areas. So again, we're working with a project, and again, it's Alliance Leisure who are de- developing, which is in Mablethorpe, which is a leisure and learning hub. Yeah. So again, it's 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 providing a, it's right sort of in the middle of the town. It's um, linked to learning, obviously with yeah. the college. So it's providing um, educational opportunities, but it's also seen as a tourist attraction mm. for, the, for the, the number of wet days that we have in the summer where people aren't on the beach. Mm. So it's providing that solution is which which may previously have been part retail yeah so it's providing a different way because as you say people are you know they're, they're spending their money differently but they yeah. also want you know high streets you want to bring people back in you want them to be social you want them to spend time and, and do an activity and also for the family in terms yeah. of fam- family opportunities so yeah, yeah we're definitely seeing those as, as solutions i guess the issues that we've got at the moment is um in terms of projects where capital costs are rising 
interest mm. rates have been high, so the funding of, of um, projects is, is, is challenging at the moment yes. um, yeah. and not as easy as, as it used to be. But it's, as you say, with some of the levelling up or the town's fund, it's making quite a big difference. Yeah, and that's a good point, isn't it, really? I think we almost think, don't ignore that, but there has been a fundamental problem over yeah. the last sort of period since well, energy prices um, and then obviously interest rates, even just yeah. supply chains. You know, yeah, construction. You know, project, yeah, no, 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 no. We were saying, you know, if you take what you'd call a traditional leisure centre, you know, leisure centre in terms of sports or swimming pool, gym, that type of maybe a soft player cafe, 26 million, you're now talking 35, 40 million yeah, in yeah. terms of the costs. And it just it makes the projects, yeah, challenging. And that, yeah. It's, yeah. I love that word. Quite often, that's when we come back. We've got some challenges. You know, so, yeah, you're ten million yeah. short, and the, you know how difficult it is to make up ten million. And so, you, you, <laughs> so, so that that's the reality, isn't it? There are some yeah. really big challenges. Yeah. And I guess that goes and that goes all the way back to the start of the chapter is please education, local authority facilities. Let's not try and duplicate because we can't afford to. Mm. You know, we've got ageing facilities and we can really look to do some really exciting things if, if at government level, we can start to join up that thinking. Yeah, yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's just so, well, it's your enthusiasm as much as anything else, Lisa, because, because uh, you know, could you, you could find yourself sort of <laughs> beaten down by the size of the challenge sometimes, can't you? So, I mean, I, I think you've always uh, inspired me to think, you know, there are ways, there's always a fresh way of looking always at it. Always a way of doing it, yeah. And it will change again, won't it? In a decade's time, if we did this, it probably would look very different again as people's leisure and um, sort of sport or physical activity needs and requirements also change and shift, yeah. you know. Yeah. So that's not, that's not a bad thing. Um, and I think probably that town centre reinvigoration and probably sort of reinvention could be part of that as yeah. well as the current stuff. And also very much at local local community level. So, yeah. so localised solutions to stuff, isn't it? Yeah, no, massive. And I think, you know, there's somebody has to take that national view and regional mm. view we need yeah. you know in terms of our olympic facilities and our for our elite i think it goes back to what you said let's not forget you know we're not throwing that out with the bathwater. Yeah. let's be strategic about this and then really think about what communities need as well yeah brilliant yeah. so a, a massive thank you for being involved yeah, in this and you. just chapter is sort of like again i think it just sort of fits in with an overall narrative of all these different pieces coming together doesn't it and there are others we've yeah. touched on it a little bit but there are others in other parts of what we would call our sector the six hundred thousand odd people working who probably don't understand this this little bit quite so well they sort of know these leisure centers exist and they'll, they'll be off somewhere else doing it um, yeah. and it's not to say any one part of our system is more important than the other but it literally is that we all have a role to play with a segment of the population don't we and yeah you know some of the other stuff thing. we'll be looking at is this pivot to health another sort of space but that's and again that's another slightly <laughs> different yeah. approach to this isn't it but getting it right for local authorities we need this level of stock to keep the people who are currently involved in sport and they're saying actually don't we so thank you for all that you do <laughs> for helping uh, local no, authorities it's this, really uh, interesting and as you own. say it's, it's so interesting seeing all the different chapters and seeing it is seeing it, um each organization sort of area and niche because we as you say we all think that we're, we're in the middle of everything that's super important to us and you forget everything else that's going on <laughs> As you know, I've always enjoyed that helicopter view just to say, hang on a minute, someone over here is doing some really good job. You two just need to talk. And uh, and quite often solutions come from that, don't you, when you sort yeah. of see it from a different perspective. So it's been brilliant, as always, to, to, to work with you. And I think there's more we can do on this. Sort of like Now we've got this overall picture, so sort of dig deep a little bit. And I think yeah. more than anything is these examples of best practice to make sure they get their landing with the right people, both at a policy level, but also, you know, consistently across other decision makers as the nature of policy making changes in the country so it's much more sort of localized mayors sort of local authorities mm -hmm. etc i mean that picture of what it looks like is shifting quite dramatically and a lot of that decision you're making we made at regions and yeah. the county level as well as district level won't they so you know your influence is, is really important in sort of pulling it all together mm -hmm. no, perfect well thank you very much yeah. for having me i've enjoyed it and i'll be looking forward to all the other different podcasts you do with everybody else <laughs> that's very kind lisa i hope yeah you're, you're our second listener that'd be great <laughs> no really great to, really great as always to catch up with you and really thanks for your time no problems lovely perfect thanks for listening to the latest podcast hopefully you found it helpful and you've gained some insights from our guest if you have enjoyed it today it would be really helpful to hit the like button and subscribe wherever you get your podcast from. 
As always, feel free to pop over to any of our social media channels to comment or ask a question. Or sign up to our monthly newsletter at sportsthinktank.com. If you're interested in supporting our work at the Sports Think Tank, again, just head over to the website or drop me an email. Thanks, and see you again next time. Thank you.